Okay, so are you seeing them now in big, full screen? It looks, it looks great. And um, everyone should feel free to, you know, make this as seminar-like as, as, uh, as possible. That's typically how we, we do it. So take it away, Isabella. Excellent. Um, first of all, thank you so much for, for the invitation. Um, I was particularly honored to also be part of the, the, Ronald, the, the com mini conference in the honor of Professor Ronald Jones. Unfortunately, I was not able to ever meet him in person, but uh, I can only hope uh, one day to be as praised as a colleague, scholar, professor, and advisor. Um, and also very happy to be part of the virtual international trade and macro seminar. Uh, this is a paper jo joined with uh, Jose Vasquez, who's also a postdoc at Princeton University like me. He will help me with the chat. And Alonso Alfaro Reña from the Central Bank of Costa Rica. So why are we studying this, uh, this uh, research question? So uh, as you know, most countries around the world, both developed and developing, use very generous uh, incentives in the form of a public tra a tax break, productive public infrastructure, with the hope to attract superstar firms, typically multinationals in the case of developing countries, to their geography. Why do they do that? They do that in the expectation that once multinationals come to their geography, they will not only uh, create direct good jobs and push the productivity frontier in their own industry, but that they would also trigger productivity upgrades, performance upgrades throughout the rest of the economy. While relationships between domestic firms as suppliers and multinational affiliates in the country as buyers are not the only channel through which these productivity upgrades might occur, uh, the literature on which uh, this paper builds on has identified these supplying linkages as the most likely conduit for performance upgrades. Hence, uh, the extent to which the hopes for indirect performance upgrades of governments are met uh, relies heavily on the answer to the question, what happens to domestic firms in a developing country upon becoming suppliers to a multinational affiliate in its own country? If this is an old question and we're bringing new evidence to it. So if you've ever gone on Google Scholar and looked for the words FDI and productivity, there are about 220,000 results. Clearly we're not the first people who are interested in this question. Um, so you might wonder uh, what are the challenges in that literature and what is, why is another paper useful? So um, all of these challenges are somehow related to data availability. So let me be specific. First, uh, until recently, it has been exceedingly difficult to observe at the level of an entire economy all relationships between firm to f uh, firms, uh, between two different, uh, given firms, and in particular between domestic firms as suppliers and multinational affiliates as buyers. For this reason, the common practice in the literature has been to use as an explanatory variable an industry level measure of FDI exposure, which was built on sector level input output tables and um, sector level measures of foreign ownership. Why is that a problem? That's a problem because with the data that I will uh, soon describe, we're able to show uh, that um, the actual relationships between um, a domestic firm and, uh, and a multinational um, is explained less than 1% uh, by the uh, industry level uh, FDI exposure measures. Hence, the explanatory variables that were used before were incredibly noisy. Moreover, because we are not able to observe which relationships uh, are established between domestic firms and multinationals, it's also hard to tease out the direction of causality between subsequent improvements in TFP and uh, these um, measures of FDI exposure. So one concern that you might have is one of reverse causality in which multinationals choose as suppliers firms that are already embarked on a, a pattern of improvement in firm performance. And last, because we are not able to observe the firms that start uh, getting relationships with multinational buyers, we're also um, at a difficulty to bring insights on how and why firm performance is improved. So motivated by these challenges, uh, this project has, um, this team has looked for a context where we can overcome it and find such, found such a context in Costa Rica. In Costa Rica, we were able to put together a rich set of administrative data sets of which the jewel of the crown is one that allows us to map the quasi-universe of firm-to-firm transactions between all formal firms in the economy, 
And more specifically, this is allowing us to observe uh, domestic firms engaging in first-time relationship with multinationals as they form, evolve, and dissolve. Moreover, to tease out the direction of causality, we will use a series of event study designs where an event is, def is defined as the first time a given domestic firm supplies to a multinational affiliate in the country. And I will go through excruciating detail explaining why we think this is an appropriate causal design. In the main um, uh, sample, in the main uh, exercise, we will use all economy-wide uh, first-time relationships between a domestic firms and multinationals. And in two alternative exercises, first, we will make use of a government matching program in which the government acts as a matchmaker between domestic firms and multinationals. Uh, this program has some interesting features that allow us to, to get at causality. Um, and second, we will use a variety of matching estimators uh, that I will be more specific on when we get there. And the third, uh, we're promising something on insights and, and channels relative to how firm performance improves. Uh, the way we will do this is in three layers. First, we will uh, use standard measures of firm performance, such as firm size or standard measures of, uh, that are more transparent, such as value added per worker or sales per worker, and also go to uh, production, more standard uh, production function estimations that give us the TFP residual. But we can do something more with the data that we have. So we no not only observe the relationship between uh, a given domestic firm and its first multinational buyer, but we also observe all other relationships that this first time multinational buyer has with uh, all its other buyers. And we will propose a stylized model that will allow us to infer what has happened to the performance of the firm based on what is happening with the performance of that firm in its relationship with all its other buyers. And last, we're going to bring more qualitative um, insights from a survey that we have designed and conducted in Costa Rica. In the interest of time, I will uh, skip the literature review slide, but we're standing on the shoulders of giants. So what is the structure of the presentation for today? First, data and context. Then we will talk about causality and why we think uh, our estimates have a causal interpretation and less about um, firm performance. So let's talk about the data. Uh, we have we put together three types of data. First, administrative data. Um, so we're able to merge uh, the firm-to-firm -firm transaction data uh, from Costa Rica. So the Ministry of Finance since 2008 is tracking all firm-to-firm -firm sales uh, that amount to more than $4,200 per year uh, between any two given um, formal firms in the economy. So we're able to observe not just the extensive margin of who is connected with whom, but also the intensive margin of how much firms transact in a given year. Second, we're uh, adding the corporate income tax data, which gives us typical balance sheet variables, uh, such as profits, value added, net assets, um, so on and so forth. Third, we're putting together data from the Social Security Fund, uh, which is um, linked employer-employee data, and this allows us to look at or control for the um, compos composition of workers of firms in a given year. And last, because we're interested in who are the multinationals in Costa Rica um, at a multinational affiliates of a, at, in a given point in time, we uh, put together a comprehensive uh, data set on foreign ownership in the country. Second, in an alternative research design, as I described two slides ago, we're going to make use of a government matching program called Productive Linkages, in which uh, a government institution called Procomer acts as a matchmaker between domestic firms wanting to become suppliers to multinationals and multinational affiliates being willing to be supplied by domestic firms locally. So how does this work? First, the uh, Procomer, this government institution, uh, carries out comprehensive evaluations of uh, potential domestic suppliers on criteria that are relevant to multinationals. Uh, a compre comprehensive set of uh, such criteria and assigns a score uh, to each candidate domestic supplier that reflects its readiness, its ability to start supplying to a multinational. Whenever a multinational reaches out with a specific input need, the government shares with this multinational uh, a short list of the domestic potential uh, candidate uh, domestic suppliers that have um, that are able to uh, supply the necessary input um, and that are the highest ranked uh, firms uh, able to do that. 
And afterwards, we also see the deals that are mediated. And last, uh, the last data set is uh, the survey data. So we have designed and conducted a, um, a, a survey to both managers of domestic suppliers and multinational uh, affiliates in the country. Uh, we have made sure that th this survey is representative of the main uh, analysis sample. Why did we do this service uh, survey? Because as rich as administrative data can be, um, it still lacks some uh, type of information um, on how exactly these matches uh, occur and how exactly these relationships evolve. Um, and uh, that's what motivated us to, to, to do that. So before going to uh, what we're actually doing, let me first uh, describe to you what are the actors in this play. So we have multinationals, we have first time suppliers, and then we have the relationships between them. So first, uh, the multinational buyers. So just to clarify a language and for everyone to be on the same page, uh, what we're referring to multinational buyers, we're referring to multinational affiliates that are located in Costa Rica and whose uh, a corporate owner, whose ultimate owner is a country different from Costa Rica. So we're talking about foreign multinationals in the country. You might be interested in domestic multinationals. There are very few such, uh, such firms, so we're not really missing much by, by excluding them. So there are 444 uh, first-time multinational buyers in the sense that there are 444 uh, MNC affiliates that trigger a first-time supplying event for a given domestic firm in Costa Rica in our sample period, which is 2010 to 2015. In terms of their size, uh, the average number of workers that they employ is 381, with a median of 170. In terms of the industries in which they operate, two-thirds of them operate in high-tech, high-knowledge intensive industries. So you can think of both manufacturing and services, such as uh, the manufacturing of medical equipment, or um, the or ICT services, and the remaining third are in low tech, low uh, knowledge intensive. You could think of um, as accommodation, or you could think of as agriculture. Um, in terms of where that where they come from, uh, half of them are from the U.S., so their main headquarter is in the U.S., and the other half are split between Latin America and the Caribbean and Western Europe. Uh, now, in terms of the domestic firms, uh, there are 3,700 3, domestic firms that become first-time suppliers to one of these 444 multinational buyers sometime in our um, event study window, which is 2010 to 2015. In 2009, the year just before the, the, the analysis period, uh, their size is, on average, um, they're employing 20 workers, and the, the median is eight. So you should think of these firms are as being small, um, it, which is typical for, for um, a developing country, but not as small as not, to, as not to be robust enough to start supplying to a multinational. So it's hard for a, for a micro enterprise hiring three, four workers to be able to, to satisfy the needs of a multinational. In terms of uh, their sectoral composition, uh, it's reverted with respect to that of multinationals. So two thirds uh, of these domestic suppliers are in low tech, low knowledge intensive industries. So you could think of the manufacturing of nuts and bolts, or you could think of um, maintenance services for the fleet of the multinational. And the remaining third are in high tech, high knowledge intensive industries. So how is the first interaction between these multinational buyers and these domestic suppliers? So the first transaction on average uh, in the year of the event is of $62,000 um, and the median is of $19,000. On average, this represents 19% of the sales of the domestic firm in that year and a median of 6%. And in terms of the length of this first time relationship with a multinational buyer, uh, the average length is, length is two years and, and 2.8 years and the median is two years. So what these numbers are telling you is this, that these first time relationships with the multinationals are substantial enough to you know, give us hope that there will be something interesting to find. Okay, so is if there are no questions, then, yes. It's Mario Cuccini, just a quick question. Uh, yes. So formal markets are significant in uh, Costa Rica. So should I, is, are there trans Actions that will be recorded between the informal sector and these companies, or should I think about that as measurement error? How is that going to work? 
Yes, so uh, the firm to firm transaction data, because of, of it being an official source, um, it, it ha Yuan has to have a tax ID payer to be part uh, of, of the data set. So we're only capturing transactions between formal firms. Um, on the other hand, uh, given the research question uh, that we have, which is one related to relationships with multinationals, our conjecture, which of course is impressionistic, we cannot check in the data, is that multinationals would not um, accept being supplied by informal firms because uh, they have a reputation to defend and also the firms have to be serious enough and reliable enough uh, to be chosen as a, as a as a domestic supplier. So we think that we're not, even if we're not observing uh, informal relationships, uh, this is not uh, problematic for our research question, but it, it's, it's a great point. Thank you. Okay, so uh, if no further questions, then let me go to the empirical strategy. So as I said, uh, our main empirical strategies in event study design. So let me spell it out exactly what we're doing. So again, the event is the first time a given domestic firm starts supplying to a multinational buyer in the country. So we're going to rearrange uh, calendar years in such a way that whatever that first year is, that will be the event year, event year zero. So how does the empirical specification look? On the left-hand side, we have a firm level outcome where I is the firm, T is the year. So we have um, um, outcomes at the level of the firm year. And on the right-hand side, we're going to control for firm fixed effects. So this means that we are controlling for within, uh, with, so we're gonna study within firm changes across time. Um, moreover, we're going to control for very, a very fine grained set of uh, four digit industry by province by year fixed effects. So this means that uh, our control group implicitly will be firms that are in the same four digit industry and the same province as, um, as the treated firm, as the firm that becomes a supplier to multinationals. And we're taking away all common sector by uh, province by year uh, shocks. And then we have our coefficients of interest, which are the theta case, uh, which are the, the event study coefficients. And whenever I will refer to, um, uh, to a magnitude, it will always be with respect to event year minus one, to the year before becoming a supplier to multinationals. So what is at this point the identifying assumption uh, for uh, the, this theta case to have a causal interpretation? The identifying assumption is that firms that are yet to supply to a multinational they form a credible uh, counterfactual for firms that start supplying to multinationals after we've account for observed and unobserved time uh, invariant differences between firms through the alpha i's for the firm fixed effects and common sector by year by, um, by province uh, fixed effects. So one concern that you might have at this point is should we include in this sample firms that uh, only firms that become first-time suppliers? Or should we also include firms that are never suppliers? Firms that throughout the entire period we don't observe as, um, as, as not supplying to multinationals. So your concern might be, well, uh, if we had, if we could see the two samples, one in which we include the never suppliers and what, one in which we don't, then we could see whether what we're finding, uh, the, the the effects that we're, uh, we're estimating, whether they're driven by the contrast with the never suppliers, which you might think are different firms for whatever reason, um, or is it driven by the staggered timing of the event? So to explore this, uh, this question, here I'm going, we're going to um, show you the results for total sales, uh, so for the total size of the firm. Uh, but uh, we invite you to the paper to see how the results look for all other variables. And the patterns are very similar if you look at net assets, materials, labor, TFP residual, et cetera. But let me focus on total sales because it's very transparent. So what do we have here? On the left-hand side, we have the sample in which we include the never suppliers. And on the right-hand side, we have the sample in which we exclude the never suppliers. And what we're plotting are the theta k's, are the uh, event study coefficients. So what are the takeaways from, the, from looking at these graphs individually and also from comparing them? So first, uh, we noticed that in both graphs, uh, there is no evidence that 
firms that become suppliers to multinationals are somehow selected into the event based on pre-existing trends in firm performance. Okay, so I am not saying that firms cannot be different in levels. They can be different in levels. One could be larger than the other, but there, there's no pattern by which firms that become suppliers to multinationals were already engaged in growth uh, in some measure of firm performance. So this is one uh, important um, finding uh, in terms of identification. In terms of thinking about what drives the event, uh, looking at the pattern of the coefficients and also at the point estimates, we notice that comparing the two graphs, uh, we find very similar point estimates. What does this mean? What is this teaching us? This is teaching us that it's not the contrast with the never suppliers that is, uh, that is driving our effects, but it's really the staggered timing of the event uh, that is the main driver. So these are kind of the, the two takeaways. Uh, going forward, uh, we will only focus on the full okay. sample, which you, yes. Is there yes. kind of a third takeaway, which is the persistence, because you said most of the relationships only last two years, and yet it's staying high beyond two years. Yes, uh, exactly. Thank you for pointing that out. So we're going to make a big deal out of that in the, uh, once we get to sort of the firm performance part, in which we talk less about uh, causality and more, more, more about the effects. But yes, thank you, for, for uh, Sam, for pointing, out, pointing it out at this point. Okay, so going forward, only the full sample that includes uh, uh, first time suppliers and never suppliers, but if that's not your favorite sample, the, the paper always uh, shows the results for both. So what are the remaining checks? Uh, what would we want to do more to, to really make sure that these um, estimates have a causal interpretation? Well, you might say, I would like to compare the outcomes of the first time suppliers to the contemporaneous contemporaneous being a key word, outcome of similar firms. So firms that uh, look as similar as possible or that were equally ready to start supplying to multinationals. So the way we do that is first we're going to have the productive linkages exercise and then we're going to use uh, three different magic estimators. And the purpose of this exercise is to show you that the results are not driven by the choice of the counterfactual. Okay, so let's see the first exercise, which is the productive linkages exercise. So this is still uh, an event study because we're still exploiting the staggered uh, timing of the events. It's not that all these deals uh, mediated by productive linkages is, are happening uh, in the same year. However, it has some different um, flavor relative, flavors relative to the event study before. So what are these flavors? First, we include the case uh, fixed effect. So this is the gamma D that is, in, um, that is in blue here. So what does the case fixed effect or the shortlist fixed effect do? The shortlist fixed effect uh, reproduces in a regression framework uh, the idea that we want to compare contemporaneously between the outcomes of the winning firm in a given shortlist and the outcomes of the losing firms in the same shortlist, okay? And now because we observe both who the losers and the winners are, we're able to look both at what happens to the outcomes of the losers in a given shortlist and what happens to the difference between the winner and the losers. So why is this not the main event study design? Some of you might find it you know, more convincing or you might like it more. Well, first, because in order to apply a very strict and clean research design, we get to a smaller sample. So re results are noisier um, than the results for the full sample. And moreover, uh, while we find evidence both in the administrative data and in the survey data that point to the fact that deals that are mediated by the government are very similar to the deals that are not mediated by the government, uh, still you might be concerned about external validity. You might be concerned that there's something special and unobserved about these deals that are mediated by the, this program. Okay, so with no further ado, Let's try to think about this research design. So one concern before showing you the results that you might have in your mind is that um, firm, uh, firms that uh, win uh, these first time deals with multinationals are systematically different uh, in terms of their score, systematically be better scored than the firms uh, that are uh, losers in the same shortlist. So what we're showing in this uh, two histograms, on the left-hand side, we're showing the scores of all winners and losers. 
And on the right hand side, we show the difference within a given shortlist between the score of the winner and the scores of the, the average scores of the losers. And what we're observing, uh, or why we're concluding from the two graphs, is that, that there's no systematic pattern by which the firms that become uh, the winner from a given shortlist is, are always the higher uh, ranked, the higher scored firms. Uh, moreover, we also look at other uh, observables in the administrative data in the year before uh, the deal. And again, we fail to find evidence that firms are systematically different. So in terms of, um, what should I say, in terms of intuition, you might think, well, then why is it that one firm is a winner and the other, the other one isn't? So from what we understood by talking to firms that have been involved in this kind of deals, the typical answer is, well, these firms were actually very similar among each other, but at some point one was offering a service that was a little bit closer to what we were looking for, or the location of the firm was a little bit closer to our plant and we thought that was uh, attractive to us, uh, as opposed to things that you could think are predictors of future uh, performance uh, of those firms. Okay, so with that context in mind, let's look at the results from the Productive Linkages Program. What I'm showing you, uh, what we're showing you in these graphs are on the left hand side what happens to the outcomes of the losers uh, in the dash and what happens to the outcomes of the winners and here what happens to the outcomes of the winners relative to the losers. And there are two takeaways. Uh, one that, well three takeaways. We continue finding uh, evidence that firms are not selected into supplying to multinationals based on pre-existing trends. Uh, second, we find we continue finding um, a, and of a similar magnitude improvements in firm performance uh, after becoming a supplier to multinationals. And third, uh, at least in this context, we fail to find evidence of business stealing or of other negative effects on firms that are not chosen. So this goes in line with, uh, with the, the, the story that we were um, trying to build. You might be concerned, uh, given the, what we, you've seen so far, well, the, the sample is small, so the results are noisy. Is there something that we can do in the large sample, in the economy-wide unmediated sample of first-time supplying events, which is the same as the main event uh, sample that I showed you before, but that resembles, that has the flavor of the productive linkages program? So uh, what we've done is to propose uh, three matching estimators as another way to, to look at the data uh, in which the control group for a given uh, first time supplier are the three firms in the same four digit sector as the four, uh, first time supplier, which have either the closest predicted Procomer score to the one of the first time supplier in its event year. So we predict Procomer scores based on the sample uh, from productive linkages. We see what predict those scores, and then we go to the big sample and, and create a predicted Procomer scores. Second, we do a more plain vanilla propensity score matching. So we choose the three firms in the four digit um, sector of the first time supplier with the closest propensity score to the one of the first time supplier in its event. And third, we also use a technique which is called nearest neighbor matching in which we find the three firms which are most similar in terms of their pre-event outcomes in the three years before the event. So now let's see how the results look. So here what we have is the main uh, event study graph that we've seen a couple of slides back. This is the one based on predictive programmer scores. Uh, this is the one uh, on propensity score matching and this is the nearest uh, neighbor matching. So despite uh, these methods being very different among each other, uh, we continue finding very similar results. Uh, so again, it's not that firms were embarked on a pre-existing positive uh, trend in firm performance uh, in all of these graphs. And moreover, we still find this uh, very striking improvement in firm performance after uh, the event. And the magnitudes are also very similar. So what are it's the takeaway from all these, uh, all these results that I've uh, inundated with you with? The takeaway is that it doesn't seem that results are driven by the choice of the counterfactual. But uh, a last remaining concern that you might have is, what if there is a firm-specific shock that has the following characteristics? It affects the timing of the first deal with a multinational. 
It influences firm performance after the deal with the multinational, but somehow it doesn't affect firm performance before the deal, because if it did, then we would observe it in the pre-trends uh, of these event studies, right? So if we could find such a firm specific shock, then, um, then we would be in trouble. So we sort of did brainstorming among ourselves, uh, also with people like yourselves, and we kind of decided that the most plausible such firm specific shock was a contemporaneous change in management. So for instance, if firms had hired a new manager in the year of the event or the year just before, and that person would have been able both to trigger the first time relationship with a multinational because that person was well connected, maybe it had worked, maybe that person had worked at the multinational before. And if that person would be able to improve firm performance on her own, then we would be misattributing uh, all of the firm performance to the first deal with the multinational when in fact uh, the cause, the root cause is the hiring of the manager. So to rule out this concern, we, uh, we uh, rely heavily on our uh, matched employer employee data. We identify the firms that uh, experience a change in management in the year of the event or in the year before. We throw out all those firms and what we're finding are basically very similar results. So at least this firm specific shock, which we thought was the most plausible, does not seem to be the driver of what we're finding. So to conclude on this section, um, we have shown in different ways that it's really uh, the event of becoming a supplier to a multinational that seems to be the trigger of the improvement in firm performance that I will be talking to you about in, in the remaining uh, third of the presentation. There are no questions, uh, I will then get to that. Okay, so uh, I'll just take a sip of water. I'll ask a quick question because I, I missed something. Yes, sir. Which, um, <clears throat> suppose there was like a firm with 500 employees who I started working with, um, who's not a multinational. You guys did mm -hmm. some version of controlling for that um, so that you really get the multinational component. I, I probably just missed it. Yeah, so uh, are you thinking if in case these firms got like a similar magnitude demand effect, but from a firm that is not a multinational, but a domestic firm? Yeah. yeah, so uh, ideally we would have wanted to have a placebo in which we would have looked at the event of becoming a supplier to a big domestic firm. Unfortunately, uh, in Costa Rica, there are not many such firms, so we wouldn't have had enough power to detect the difference. Um, and just as a background, this is one of the main reasons why developing countries try to attract multinationals to begin with. Uh, however, what we're going to show uh, in this last section is a placebo in which instead of becoming a supplier to a big domestic firm, you become a supplier to the government. And uh, when I get there, uh, I will, we will argue that um, everything in terms of the demand shock is very similar between becoming a supplier to the government and becoming a supplier to multinationals minus the possibility of, of knowledge spillovers that becoming a supplier to multinationals triggers. I mean, it seems like you could have calculated some sort of elasticity so that near, if there aren't firms with 500 people, there are firms with 200 people. And then you could sort of see, is it sure. really, really nonlinear um, with, with these multinationals? I, yeah, I, you know, I think we can do, I think we can do better than that. Uh, so maybe there is a way parametrically to, to compare. It's just that if you wanted to isolate the multinational effect as opposed to size, industry, technological sophistication, the ideal case would be to find a placebo firm that meets all these three criteria. But I agree with you that we could do more on that dimension. Good. Great. Thank you. So thank you as well. So in terms of firm performance, um, as in any economy-wide study, so not in an RCT, but um, a sort of a study that relies on administrative data, we don't have data on prices, quantity, quality of inputs and outputs. This is standard whenever one relies on administrative data. So what is the problem with that? The problem is with that is that whenever we want to think about TFP estimation, uh, then we have the, the typical omitted price biases and, and so on uh, and so forth. So how do we try to make progress uh, despite that? Well, we have a three-pronged approach. First, we take the beaten path of looking at standard measures of firm performance. 
um, such as firm size, uh, transparent measures of firm performance, or the TFP residual coming from uh, TFP estimation. And just to give you some numbers, because I'm not going to insist on these results in the interest of time, we're finding that four years after becoming a supplier to multinationals, these firms are much larger. Um, so they uh, employ 26% more workers, uh, have 22% uh, more net assets, um, and have much higher measures of, um, of let's say, uh, labor productivity. Also, when we do the classic uh, production function estimation techniques, depending on the method, which might be your favorite method, we get a TFP residual, which is between 6 and 9% higher four years after the event relative to the year before. But what I told you is that using our firm to firm data, uh, we are able, we think we have additional insights that are novel in this literature and hopefully uh, novel uh, be, um, beyond it. So let's uh, plunge directly into that. So what are we, what am I showing in these two graphs? Um, on the left hand side, um, what we're doing is we're uh, taking the total revenues, the total sales of the firm in each year. And we're subtracting from that the value uh, in that year uh, of sales made to the multinational that triggered the event. Okay, so mechanically before the event, uh, total sales and sales to others are the same thing. Uh, however, afterwards, uh, of course, the two differ. Uh, on the left hand, on the right hand side, what we do is we sum up from the firm to firm transaction data all the transactions that we observe in, um, in this firm-to-firm -firm data. And from that, we isolate, we take out uh, the sales made to the multinational triggering the event. So why are the two graphs different? Because uh, total um, transactions are a subset of the total revenues. So what could be in the total revenues beyond a total transactions? You could have uh, sales to the final consumer. You could have transactions which are under the reporting threshold of 4,200, or you could have exports, okay? So what are we learning by looking at these two graphs? First, we're learning that um, in the short run, um, namely in the year of the event, firms grapple with uh, short-term capacity constraints meaning that uh, in the short run, they have to sort of tone down their relationships with other buyers in order to be able to accommodate the new multinational contract. However, interestingly, in the years that follow, uh, the sales to others progressively improve um, such that uh, four years after, the sales to others are 20% higher. So these, are, these effects are not mechanical because again, we're taking out the sales uh, to the multinational that triggered the event. So they indicate that there's something happening to this firm uh, that is uh, appealing to other buyers beyond the relationship with the multinational triggering the event. But we have richer data, so we could say even more about what are the margins of adjustment? How are these firms reacting in their relationships with all other buyers to becoming a supplier to multinationals? So here on the left hand side, we have the extensive margin. So we have the number of other buyers that these firms have as we observe them in the firm to firm data. And on the right hand side, we have the intensive margin, which we define as the average sales that these firms make to the uh, to these uh, other corporate uh, buyers, buyers observed in the firm to firm data. So what are we learning by looking at these two graphs? We're learning that in the short run, the adjustment is not made on the extensive margin. Uh, these firms uh, keep their number of, uh, of other buyers, but the adjustment is happening in toning down very significantly the amounts that they sell to these other buyers. Moreover, four years after, uh, the number of other buyers improves by 31%, and the average sales to other buyers improves by 14%. So, Basically, two thirds of the improvement in business to others that these firms have occurs on the extensive margin, occurs through their improved ability to match with more buyers, and a third occurs through uh, their ability to sell more in any given relationship. Uh, in the paper, we provided more evidence on what type of corporate buyers they sell to, if, they're, if they tend to be more multinationals, if they tend to be larger, if they tend to be in more sectors. 
um, and also what happens on the intensive margin if you define it more strictly um, within a given supplier um, uh, buyer pair. Okay, so given that we, uh, we, yes. Question, can I ask, uh, so Isabel, yes, please, does, this suggest, does this suggest maybe they're targeting expansion and the multinational is one of the acquired uh, buyers or could there be a bit of reverse So if you're, th are you thinking, for instance, th that they would be buying a new machine or that they would expand capacity in some other way? Is, is this what you're having in mind? Uh, yeah, just the idea that they're, obviously they're selecting into the multinational relationship, but if they're doing it with other relationships simultaneously, then maybe it's the, uh, the, the firm on the other side of the multinational that's changing its behavior. At least that could be part of the narrative. Do you see what I mean? I understand. So um, first, I think one, uh, it's, it's a qualitative answer, but it's something that I think would be helpful for context. The vast majority of firms in Costa Rica would love to be a supplier to multinationals. Everyone sees the benefit of becoming a supplier to multinationals. So the problem is actually on the other side, is that multinationals typically are very reluctant to get local suppliers. So the idea that a given small domestic firm would be able to target uh, its first relationship with a multinational buyer to coincide with some other shock that is unobserved to us that would explain these other events to us, we think is not very likely. Because again, um, this is a two side decision. Multinationals typically are very difficult in, in uh, accepting to uh, to get a given uh, domestic firm. And um, the idea that the domestic firm would be able to perfectly target its first relationship with its own unobserved shock, we think is, is very unlikely. And for instance, if you're thinking about expansion of capacity, we're not finding evidence that there's a jump in net assets or other measures of, uh, of, of capital in the year of the event. And moreover, as we've, sh as we've shown um, in the previous slide, these firms are not somehow ready to receive this big, uh, um, this big demand from the multinationals because otherwise, if they were, they wouldn't have to adjust so strongly by toning down their relationships with the other buyers. So it's only in the long run that they're able to accommodate more buyers uh, and not in the short run. But it's, uh, it's, it's an interesting point, thank you. Okay, so Isabel. given this empirical, yes. Yeah, I had a quick question. Um, yes. I may, I'm probably, you probably have accounted for this and I just missed it, which is, is there a screening story that, that is out there that you're ruling out that the multinationals are just really good at figuring out who's good at, at <laughs> business operations and, and managing a firm and the other firms in Costa Rica are relying on that screening? Okay, so you're, you're thinking that uh, sort of the, there's a signaling of becoming a supplier to exactly. multinationals. Yeah, yeah. so About this is not something that... A firm. Yeah, so first, the fact that multinationals could choose in levels firms that are different is something that uh, is totally consistent with our identification story. So we allow firms that are selected to become suppliers to multinationals to be different in levels from firms that are never selected. Uh, what would be problematic with us is that is, is multinationals selecting firms based on their predicted improvement in firm performance of these firms. And again, uh, we're ruling out um, um, contemporary shocks that could explain that predicted improvement in firm performance. In terms of the signaling or reputation effect, this is actually something that uh, we allow to be a, a driver uh, of, of the extensive margin of, of the very impressive improvement, uh, improved ability to match with more buyers. Um, the purpose of, uh, of both this, this empirical evidence and of the model that I will show you in the, in the remaining 15 minutes is that uh, sometimes we call TFP, uh, in, a, in a sort of physical efficiency sense, uh, changes in firm appeal that could go beyond TFP and reputation could be, could be one of them. So um, we, we think what we're showing is, is in line with, uh, with your intuition um, quite strongly. Okay, thank you. So, 
Thank you as well. Um, okay, so um, we're going to offer now a simple model-based interpretation of the empirical facts that I've just shown you. Um, it will account for output price variation and de general returns to scale. You might be concerned that part of the, the effects that we're finding are just a demand effect uh, and then some increasing returns to scale. So it's important to, to control for that. And also the model will allow us to decompose or to sort of emphasize what is the role of um, the extensive margin, the um, improved ability to match with more buyers in explaining the overall improvement in, um, in firm performance. So what is the model in environment? Uh, I think it's, it's going to be a very familiar um, framework for all of them, all of you. So consider a supplier J that is selling a variety of a good to a number of buyers, uh, supplier I selling a variety of uh, a good to a number of buyers indexed by J. Then assume we have comp a monopolistic competition. So the firm I faces an iso uh, de isoelastic demand uh, such that the quantity that it sells to buyer J is uh, defined uh, or is determined by a demand shifter, BIJ. Uh, the unique price charged by the supplier PI and the elasticity of demand uh, sigma. Then we put a uh, we uh, we postulate a, a very general a total cost structure, in which the total cost of uh, the supplier I uh, depends on some um, constant K. So here we're assuming that suppliers are input price takers. It depends on the quantity that is produced uh, by the firm. Um, QI and uh, it depends on the composite TFP of the firm. We call composite TFP at this stage of the model anything that is physical uh, efficiency and something else that could improve uh, the appeal of the firm uh, both on the extensive and the intensive margin. And then that of the power one over gamma where gamma uh, captures the general returns to scale. So if gamma is larger than one then we have increasing returns to scale. Now consider the event where the supplier I starts selling a given amount RI to its first multinational buyer M and C0. Now let's define the sales to others, RI tilde, uh, as the price times the quantity sold to others, where again, we're taking the total uh, sales and we're excluding the sales that are made to the multinational triggering the event, which in our notation is M and C0. Then we do the derivations of the model and we arrived to this uh, relationship. The change in uh, the log change in sales that the firm I makes to other buyers depends on uh, the log change in the total scale of the firm. So this is the total sales of the firm, the sales to others plus the sales to the multinational triggering the event. Um, and this, the, the parameter that governs this relationship is called delta, where delta captures both the demand parameter and the general returns to scale parameter. Then the sales to others depend on what happens to total TFP, uh, composite TFP as we've called it, and what happens to the demand shifters of all other buyers. So note that uh, the total scale of the firm uh, through what uh, through the demand shock coming from the multinational may affect the sales to others even if we don't sh uh, have shocks to composite TFP or to the demand shifter the demand shifters of others. Why? Because a change in total production could change the marginal cost and uh, the de this demand effect on the total uh, sales to others is governed by this uh, parameter delta which will be a very uh, important parameter to us. Now, in order to uh, get a formula for what is happening to composite TFP, um, let's make the following assumption. We assume that the demand shifters of all other buyers do not change systematically due to the event. So if they were to change systematically during, uh, during the event, then this change in the demand shifters of all other buyers, right now we're lumping it with the composite TFP. So if we make this assumption, then we can identify uh, the change in composite TFP by looking at what happens to the sales to others, which are adjusted by what happens to the total scale of the firm, where the adjustment is governed by this parameter delta. So for instance, if uh, delta is negative, so if the firm has decreasing returns to scale, 
then we have to adjust upwards the sales to others. If the firm has increasing returns to scale, so delta is positive, then we have to scale down the sales to others. Okay. And then here we have to divide by one over sigma minus one. So as I just said, the adjustment uh, through delta takes into account both this demand effect of MNC zero, the, the, the sales made to the first multinational and the potential returns to scale. So in order to get to, to an actual uh, measurement of what happens to the total composite TFP of the firm, we will obviously need uh, an estimate for sigma and an estimate for delta where the sales to others and the total sales are things that we observe in the data. Note that up to this point, this is a model of the intensive margin only. So here we're not saying anything about how firms, um, you know, what happens to the probability of firms of matching with, uh, with more buyers, okay? So what if we try to relax this assumption and also add to the extensive margin because as we've seen before, a lot of the action is happening on the, actually two thirds of the action is happening on the extensive margin. So how do we do that? We keep the same assumptions uh, of an isoelastic demand and cost structure, but we add the assumption that the probability of selling to a given buyer J, NIJ, uh, is some function of physical productivity in this case, and some umbrella term called reputation. So you could think of it as reputation, signaling, or anything else that is not physical productivity, but that affects, that improves the ability of the first time supplier to a multinationals to match with more buyers subsequent to its first deal with a multinational. Hence, the effective demand will depend on this probabilistic term and the demand that we had before. So if we want to get separately what happens to the physical productivity, so not just to, not to the composite TFP, uh, composite uh, TFP that puts together intensive margin and extensive margin factors, we could add a bit more structure to see what that would give us. So these are uh, assumptions that uh, some of them you could sort of um, say they're too strong. Uh, but, and we're happy to relax them in future work. The idea is not to say these are the best assumptions. The idea is to say, you know, how important is this extensive margin potentially in driving the effect? So what are the assumptions? First, uh, that there's a large set of potential buyers J. Uh, this may, makes the expected number of other buyers equal to the, the sum of probabilities. And second, we're assuming that for any change in the TF, uh, physical TFP of the firm or in the reputation of the firm, all buyers J equally adjust their probability of buying from the firm. Okay, so by, by making these two assumptions, we're able to look at what happens to physical productivity alone as opposed to uh, composite uh, productivity, which uh, combines the intensive and the extensive margin. And we do that by looking at what happens to the adjusted uh, intensive margin. So why am I calling this uh, adjusted intensive margin? It's an intensive margin because we're dividing by the, um, the number of other buyers. And it's adjusted because again, we are uh, adjusting the sales to others by what is happening to the total scale of the firm. Okay, so again, we need sigma and delta in order to be able to say something about what happens to total TFP. So a different way to um, uh, sort of phrase what is happening uh, in these assumptions is that basically we're saying the intensive margin, how much you sell in a given relationships, relationship conditional on there being a relationship, only depends on TFP. And we allow um, uh, reputation to have a bite in the extensive margin. And we sort of infer what has happened to, uh, to physical TFP by looking at what happens to the adjusted intensive margin. Okay. So um, in the last five minutes, I'm going to try to tell you how we're estimating uh, delta and what we learn once we estimate delta and sigma. So again, what was delta? Delta was that parameter that was governing the importance of the total scale of the firm on uh, the sales to others. So let's uh, make the following thought experiment. Consider a buyer K different from MNC zero and maintain the same assumptions that we've had so far. So exactly the same model, but instead of excluding MNC zero, 
let's exclude another buyer K, a different buyer K, which will be the Costa Rican government in a second. So then we will arrive to a relationship uh, whose empirical counterpart will be the following, in which we will see what is the relationship between the total scale of the firm and what happens to the average sales to others when we have excluded the sales to buyer K. The problem is that if we were to run uh, an OLS regression in which we will say, okay, what happens to the average sales to others when you exclude the government, if you become a first time supplier to the government, as it relates to the total scale of the firm, you or for or any other buyer, you might be concerned. Um, okay, so let, let me take that back. Sorry, I didn't explain well. So don't think about the government now. Think about any type of change in the total scale of the firm. Okay, total a change in total scale of the firm, and we're looking at what happens to the average sales to others. Um, in in general, if we run this OLS regression, you might be concerned that there is some unobserved factor. Uh, for instance, a shock in TFP that could explain both the, the, the change in, uh, in total scale in, and the change in average sales to others. So if we want to estimate this consistently, if we want to estimate this delta consistently, we have to find a scenario in which we have a shock to the total scale of the firm, but that shock to the total scale of the firm is not accompanied by a change in the TFP of the firm. We think such a shock can be provided by uh, looking at the event of becoming a first time supplier to the government. So why are we looking to, um, at this event? We're looking at this event because like multinationals, uh, the government of Costa Rica is large and uh, it's a large and reliable payer. Uh, the suppliers to the government of Costa Rica are also chosen through transparent tenders. So there is a similarity with um, the process of being chosen uh, to be a supplier to the multinationals. Um, without us doing any sort of um, um, restriction, uh, the average first sale to the government is very similar to the average first sale to multinationals. The relationships have similar duration. Um, and also the, the composition of the samples is very similar. So for instance, we have a similar percentage of first time suppliers to the multinationals and first time suppliers to the government. However, we think that becoming a supplier to the, to the government has a benefit in terms of the estimation of the delta, which is we think uh, it provides a shock to the total scale of the firm, but it's not a composite, uh, accompanied by a change in the TFP of the firm. There's no learning opportunity from becoming a supplier to the government. So here we're uh, pr plotting what happens to the total scale of the firm when you become a supplier to multinationals and when you become a supplier to the government. And also what happens to the TFP residual when you become a supplier to multinationals versus becoming a supplier to the government. And what we're seeing is uh, the demand shock is very similar, but the, um, the, the patterns of the total scale differ afterwards. There's something special about becoming a supplier to multinationals and becoming a supplier to the government is not accompanied by improvements in TFP, which is helpful in terms of the uh, exclusion restriction. So basically to, uh, I'm sorry, I'm rushing towards the end, but I have only one minute. Um, so what we want again is to estimate Delta. We're going to use an IV strategy in which we uh, use as an IV for the change in total sales, a dummy taking value one. If a given firm is awarded a first time government contract in year T minus one. And again, this is a shock to the total scale of the firm, but it's not accompanied by a change in TFP. We get a strong um, uh, first stage. We think that the exclusion restriction is, um, is um, uh, uh, respected because the IV is not correlated with changes in, uh, in TFP. And by doing that, we estimate uh, a delta of IV of minus 0 0.22, which uh, means we, have, we find decreasing returns to scale. What is the intuition of decreasing returns to scale? Why are we finding a negative delta? We're finding, we need to have decreasing returns to scale to rationalize that while we find a, a change, a, a jump in firm size after the firm becomes um, a supplier to the government, this is accompanied by a fall in the average sales to others. So we need decreasing returns to scale to rationalize uh, this finding. 
So with this IV estimate of delta of uh, minus 0 0.22, which is consistent with decreasing returns to scale, and by taking a sigma of 6 from the literature or by estimating our own sigma from markup estimation from the Locker and Varsinsky, we can then go and, and um, sort of fit in, in our formulas for composite TFP and TFP alone and find what is the improvement in composite TFP for years after, what is the improvement in TFP uh, alone for years after. And what we find is that on the composite TFP end, we find uh, a very similar magnitude to what we were finding from the traditional standard TFP estimation. However, when we, uh, through the lens of our model, focus on the intensive margin, we're finding that the improvement in TFP alone um, is half of that improvement in composite TFP. So the way we're interpreting this is that the extensive margin is driving half of the productivity increase. So these exercises, you can play around with them depending on the, the assumptions that you're making on the model, but the sort of the punchline of this exercise is that if we really care about uh, TFP measurement, uh, we need to think more carefully onto what we are uh, loading onto as being uh, physical TFP. Okay, so uh, I'm minus two minutes. Uh, we've done some surveys. The surveys are in line with uh, with what we found in the um, in the empirical part and in the model part. There's a transfer of knowledge that is confirmed both by suppliers and by multinationals. Interestingly, the tra transfer of knowledge is more about managerial and, and organizational practices than it is about technology, uh, which is the typical story that we had in the old FDI spillovers literature. Uh, this tra uh, transfer of knowledge is enabled by frequent interactions between multinationals and suppliers, um, audits, visits, training programs, so on and so forth. And second, both multinationals and suppliers they uh, admit that there is a, a clear improvement in supplier reputation, which makes it easier to gain the trust of new buyers, both multinationals and domestic. And um, this connects with one of your uh, points below. So I'm not going to summarize the paper again. Thank you so much for your time and apologies for the extra three minutes. I'm gonna stick around with Jose if there are uh, more questions. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Isabella. Um... And Jose, I was, I was peppering him with questions. Um, we have obviously plenty of time to um, ask some some more questions. Um, so I don't know if anyone wants to. One question just towards the end when you were talking about the decreasing returns. I'm wondering mm -hmm. if, there, if that really should be thought of more like a dynamic thing that maybe only hits for one year or something. And mm -hmm. that would be a little have a different meaning in terms of long run TFP. It's just, okay, you got to kind of get up and running and expand, but then you have more constant returns. Or I'm not sure that you've persuaded me not to feel like that's a reasonable way to think about yes. it. And then I um, guess the question so is, is that way you're estimating the decreasing returns and having a big implication for this half of the TFP coming through? physical and half through something about spreading the word. Mm -hmm. Yes, so uh, um, this is an excellent point. Um, both the paper and the, the slides are in, in, uh, in transition uh, to their new uh, steady state. So actually, we're currently working on estimating dynamic returns to scale. Uh, so this is something that we fully believe is, is interesting and potentially has a bite. Um, and the way we would do that is we would um, sort of um, exploit the different lags as opposed to looking at only yearly changes. So I, we think this is a, a great point uh, and it's, uh, it's actually something that we're currently working on. Uh, we're sorry we weren't able to present it for today. Uh, Is Isabella, I also have a very much a clarifying question, very much close to the yes, end. You, you talk about the extensive margin, also about you know this end depend on the reputation. Uh, mm -hmm. I missed the part about, you know, how you, from the model's perspective, how you tell part the contribution of that part to your measured TFP versus the, um, the phi, which is the more like mm -hmm. the fundamental TFP in your, yeah. in your model. And then you, yeah, and in this side, when you were saying that the TFP increasing by uh, 3%, I, I, you know, I, and you said the rest is gonna be that, you know, I, I just didn't, didn't, it didn't come through, you know, just to clarify, you know, what, what sure. tells us sure, sure, sure. 
it's a fundamental versus. You didn't um, you didn't miss it. It you didn't yeah. miss it. It wasn't there. So uh, oh, oh, okay. unfortunately, yeah. uh, with the data that we have, we're not able to separate how much uh, of the extensive margin is driven by reputation separately, uh, phi separately, and the interaction of the two. So what we're doing is we're doing something different, which is we're focusing on just estimating phi, which is the physical TFP. And the way we do it is by focusing on what, one, what happens on the intensive margin. So what happens in, in your, uh, uh, how much you sell in a given relationship conditional on the relationship happening. Uh, the strong assumption that we're making there is that the intensive margin is only driven by TFP and it's not driven by reputation. So if you think that the intensive margin is also driven by reputation so that uh, there is trust that builds across time or, or the reputation, as reputation changes, you might buy more, then if anything, what the phi that we're estimating is an upper bound because we're loading the effect of reputation on the intensive margin entirely onto TFP. But again, um, on the extensive margin, we're not able to make to, to, to distinguish between the two. But it's uh, we wish we could. It's a good okay, point. Got it. Yeah. Thank you, Daniel. So I had a, a little bit of a conceptual question, which was, um, it seems like these firm, you're saying these firms get a lot of TFP gains from working with multinationals. So why aren't they actually like paying the multinationals for this, and you're not finding any of these TFP gains in terms of? You know, they give the input, they give their output at a really low price. And so, um, what, why, you know, I'm sort of just confused why that's not the, the outcome if there's really why, why it is not internalized. Uh, yeah. This, yeah. Yeah. So, we wish we would observe prices, quantities, you know, product characteristics separately to really nail it. Um, so, the answer that I'm going to give you now is sort of partial. Um, I think there is an expectation that the uh, relationships with multinationals will be beneficial uh, but these firms are financially constrained so it's hard for them to sort of you know uh, charge a price under the the, the just price uh, with the expectation that these uh, tfp gains will materialize in time uh, moreover uh, multinationals that the majority of these multinationals are part of uh, a special economic zone and they benefit from very generous tax incentives. So I think they would be under a lot of scrutiny uh, from the government and from the media if they were to squeeze too much their suppliers. Um, so in that sense, uh, that's, um, that's another reason why we think uh, it's not that the entire surplus is, is taken away. Uh, for us, the appeal of looking at what happens in the sales to others is that somehow we're isolating the relationship with the multinational. So whatever is happening in that relationship, we don't know. We don't know prices. We don't know quantities. We don't know product characteristics. We don't know markups. Uh, so we're isolating that relationship and we're focusing on all other relationships and kind of from a revealed preference approach, try to see what has happened to these firms to justify what we're observing on both the extensive and the intensive margin. Okay. Um, and, and just to connect it back to, or not to connect it forwards, mm -hmm. next week we have a, a paper that um, by uh, Yuhei Miyuchi, who, who's looking at the opposite situation, right? Where he's looking at when, when your supplier goes bankrupt and you lose, lose them. Um, but he seems to find like very similar result. This is in Japan, but everything kind of in reverse. So is there, is there any, this maybe goes back to my earlier question about whether this is really about a supplier match or the multinational. I know that the government stuff was different, but that's private mm -hmm. versus public. Um, is there any way of maybe comparing with his findings to somehow tell us that it really is the multinationals? Mm. I mean, we could, uh, we wouldn't have as, a, as clean a design as he has. I think he has a really cool way of of making sure that those bankruptcies are really exogenous or um, you know, are, are um, so I, I don't think we would have that. Um, what we could do is to try to look at unexpected bankruptcies based on observables in the years before uh, for given suppliers and see what that would mean for the multinational. My conjecture, uh, Jose, interrupt me if you if you 
feel differently is that we won't find as important effects because these suppliers are really peanuts for these multinationals. They import the majority of their inputs and the typical type of inputs that they uh, supply locally are not sophisticated, differentiated goods. Most of them, they could quickly find another supplier. Um, so my conjecture is that we would not find a strong effect, uh, if any, uh, but we haven't tried this could exercise. I, could I add something related? I, I think one thing I was wondering, but maybe you guys look at it in your paper already, is that the, the new, new other buyers, not the multinational, but the other buyers, and how close are their observable characteristics Two multinationals might provide some hint about what's special about multinationals uh, itself. Mm. You know, back to George was talking about is that if it's purely just cost reduction, and you think about the fact that the, the fact they acquire these new buyers is kind of a little bit random, then they possibly won't see a systematic connection about what these new buyers, other than multinational, look like versus multinational feature yes. itself. And given the fact that you guys see the employer, employee match data, you know, I would suggest maybe one thing you could directly look at is the composition of their labor force. And is there anything mm -hmm. special you can think about uh, that, that these new buyers have been sharing any uh, 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 common features on that dimension with the multinational? Maybe right, that could kind of tell George something. <laughs> he, yes, he might no, think it's, something it's a... It's a great question. Um, so what we have already in the paper somewhere in the appendix is we're looking at the characteristics of the new buyers, uh, whether they tend to be more exporters, um, uh, a sh higher share of exporters, whether they tend to be um, larger on the different measures of, of size. Um, and uh, we find that, and also they tend to be more multinationals. So we find that, yes, the new buyers are more likely to be exporters, are more likely to be larger, and are more likely to be multinationals themselves. Uh, so it does seem to be that there is a bite in terms of what type of new buyers these, these firms acquire. Um, and if anything, uh, remember that there was an assumption in the model in which we say that uh, the change in the probability of buying from firm I does not depend on who you are as a buyer after the shock. If this is inconsistent with what I just told you. So if we were to relax that assumption, again, we would be overestimating uh, TFP because uh, part of the increase in the average sales to others is coming from the fact that these are larger firms, uh, firms with a higher demand shifter. Um, so this is something that we, we find fascinating. So thank you for so, so allowing if, me if to my, if my uh, If I can add something, uh, I would say that something else that we look at is the number of buy-in sectors. And it seems that these firms tend to sell to different and more buy-in sectors than before. Uh, this aligns a little bit with uh, uh, survey results when we were asking firms of what was going on and they were, some of them were describing that the multinational had an input need, they were sharing with them the blueprints, that it was something they didn't know how to do before and then they will maybe start producing it, but then now that they know how to produce a new thing, they will just advertise it to other firms and this is how they were getting other clients. Uh, it may be in different sectors from the ones they were selling to before. Thank you. Great. Right. Isabel, just going back to the, I mean, the selection into, you know, it's not like a selection into treatment is exogenous. I think, you know, just thinking about who's selected into the multinational match and kind of fleshing that out a little mm -hmm. bit more for us might be helpful. Um, yeah. Because, because it is. I mean, they're drawn into that event with a bilateral decision. I mean, you can refuse. Obviously, you can refuse. You can refuse the offer. You're saying, well, why would you ever want to refuse the offer of a multinational? Well, some do. Right. Maybe they don't have the capacity uh, to expand into that uh, at the moment. Uh, so that selection into into the match, I think, was still a little a little difficult for me to fully. Uh, sure. I understand. So I think in terms of levels, uh, we we're fully transparent in the paper that firms that become first time suppliers to multinationals are slightly larger and have a slightly higher TFP than firms that never become suppliers to multinationals. So we're not claiming that uh, this is uh, the average treatment effect for any firm in the economy. 
uh, if, if that firm were to randomly be assigned a, a contract with a multinational. So we do believe that there is a certain scale of the firm and a certain minimum TFP that the firm needs to have to be able to engage in a relationship with multinationals. Uh, again, what we think would be problematic is if there's something that happens to the firm contemporaneously with the event of becoming a supplier to multinationals, which would sort of be the main reason why we're seeing these improvements in TFP. Um, and we've explored the exercises with a management change. Uh, we're happy to explore other exercises if you have a different um, sort of idea of what could be a, a, a firm specific shock that would be problematic. Um, in terms of selection, also when we do these matching estimators, uh, we use uh, different ways of defining firms that are similar on these observe on different observables in the year of the event, uh, either the uh, predicted Procomer score or the outcomes in the previous years or the propensity score, um, and again compare with respect to those firms. Um, and in the productive linkages exercise, uh, the the punchline there or the sort of the benefit of that exercise is that we're looking at firms that were equally ready, equally willing, equally interested, and similarly scored uh, to become suppliers to multinationals. Uh, so if um, your concern is that somehow it's the willingness to become a supplier or the readiness to become a supplier, um, in that winner versus losers design, this is something that we we're controlling for. But it's, I mean, uh, this is this is not an RCT. So uh, and, and under yeah, no yeah. circumstances, I will ever be able to convince you uh, that it's, com it's a completely random event. Uh, but hopefully all these different ways of, of cutting the data uh, really show that it's the event of becoming the, uh, the supplier to multinationals that is uh, what triggers the, the other changes in performance. Just to pick up on this, uh, hi, I'm Galen. Uh, perhaps some of the selection is on some of the questions you're asking in the survey about the amenability of the supplier to maintain these interactions and, and respond to the multinationals requests. And that's something mm -hmm. I guess you wouldn't be controlling for in terms of the observables before the uh, relationship, right? Yes, so the score is uh, entirely based on characteristics or on features that multinationals care about. Um, that the, so this uh, evaluation uh, on which the score is based on uh, asks questions such as, does the manager speak English? Uh, do you have a specific ISO certification? Um, do you have, um, I don't know, uh, occupational hazard training for your workers? So things that one would not typically observe uh, in administrative data, these are things that are behind the, the ProCommerce score. Um, so seeing that these firms that win and lose actually are not systematically different in terms of the score, for us was reassuring as to how ready uh, they were perceived to be by the government to start supplying to multinationals. Great. Um, so this was really great. We had a lot of uh, good discussion. Um, I, um, we'll call it a wrap on like the recording, Roman, if you can end that.